So again, we'll get started. We have a lot to talk about tonight. <clears throat> so we're at Lesson 16, Creation, Curse, Catastrophe, Part 4. Yeah, please keep hugging necks and stuff. I'll keep talking. Um, no, you're fine. I'm serious. Uh, creation, Curse, and Catastrophe, Part 4, Week 16. Can you believe it's been that long? Again, last week we looked at the science behind the global flood. We looked at uh, Walt Brown, Dr. Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, and we looked at some specifics about that. We'll touch upon that again tonight to make sure you understand one point about it, and that is really the immense pressure that the water would have been under, under setting under those hydroplate crustal plates, whether they're 60 miles feet or even if they're as thin as 10 miles thick. The pressure would have been anywhere from 60,000 PSI, even at the thin crust, to 370,000 PSI, pounds per square inch, at the 60 mile crust. We're talking immense pressure, and I want to give you an example of what water pressure can do, with numbers not even close to that. Uh, I believe we'll finish Creation, Curse, and Catastrophe next week, so we'll start rolling out the flood this week, looking at the arc, looking at details that led up to the event. We'll finish that up next week, and then we'll move into the following week, What About Dinosaurs? Now that's lesson 18, I have that just one week. I really think that'll be two, and I'll know for sure next week. So next week, but I really think there's so much material there, it's going to be two weeks, just so that I can give you the highlights of all the evidence that shows that dinosaurs lived among us and in the last 6,000 years, less than seven. And then we'll look at what about the supposed evolution of men, or man. And that'll be where we wrap it up. That'll be our final lesson of this series. That'll land us right at a 20-week series. Um, and by the way, Pastor told me as earlier that the jump drives are almost here. And so, Lord willing, next Wednesday night we'll have Walt Brown's ninth edition of In the Beginning um, available for everyone on a jump drive. So, very exciting. So, again, I want to give everyone, who was, who was not here last week? Was there anybody not here? Okay, that's good. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the hydroplate theory that we looked at last week. Now, I do that two reasons. One, for those who were not here. But two to kind of help cement this in our minds for those of us who were here, because this is, if this is the first time you've been exposed to this, there's a lot of material. And once you get that digital textbook, you're going to find that I've been giving you the 50,000 foot level as you read that textbook. He's going to dive you into some very specifics about that theory. Also, in my opinion, as this slide says, this theory fits the biblical description of the pre-flood world, as well as the cataclysm itself, better than any other theory I've ever seen. Equally, it also explained a number of anomalous anomalies on our planet um, that no other explanation seems to have a reasonable answer for. And so I think it really provides us with probably a great understanding of something, if not exactly, pretty close to what it looked like then. So this is a quick review. We can see on our planet 25 major features that we can, can now see on be our planet, systematically explained as a consequence features. of a global flood that can now be that systematically erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 30 trillion hydrocene bombs. This theory shows us just how rapidly major mountains form. It explains the coal, oil, and methane deposits, the rapid continental drift, and why the ocean, on the ocean floor there are huge trenches hundreds of canyons the the floor, and tens of thousands trenches, of volcanoes. Hundreds of canyons. Uh, this theory and also explains the ice ages volcanoes. and it gives the primary reason ice ages, for global warming. And it, it explains the formation the of the layered strata and almost all fossils. Warming. It explains the frozen the mammoths, of the layered strata major land canyons, all fossils, especially the Grand Canyon. The frozen mammoths, surprisingly, the canyons, it explains the origin of, the of Grand comets, Asteroids Surprisingly, and meteorites. It explains the origin of According to Dr. Comets, Brown's theory, the ancient world that Noah lived in was very different Brown's from the Earth we occupy the today. World that Noah, lived Noah and in other pre-flood people probably lived on one today. very large supercontinent. Noah and other pre-flood people vegetation, probably lived on one very large and major rivers. The mountains With were smaller than today's, perhaps 6,000 feet high. Before the, the flood, the flood about half the Earth's water was in interconnected chambers. Before the flood, ten miles below the Earth's surface, this formed a thin spherical shell, almost a mile thick, 
the pressure in the subterranean chamber had been increasing for centuries because the gravity of the sun and moon produced tides in the subterranean water that lifted and lowered the Earth's massive crust twice a day. This tidal pumping added gigantic amounts of energy to the subterranean water. This increasing pressure in the subterranean water steadily stretched the crust as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began as a microscopic failure in the crust that grew in both directions at almost three miles per second. Grew in the both directions following the path of least resistance encircled the globe in about two hours. As a crack raced around the earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched claw. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. The Bible the even gives us a precise date, of the, the 600th the year of Noah's life on the 17th day date. of the second month. On that day, Noah's life all the, the fountains of the great deep burst open. On that day, then it says, the and the, the rain deep burst open. The fountains of water jetted supersonically into and above the atmosphere. The, the spray from these enormous fountains produced torrential rain such as the, the Earth has never experienced before or after. The, rain such the supersonic the fountains eroded the crumbling rock on both sides of the white supersonic fountains. This produced huge volumes of sediment that settled through the floodwaters, trapping and burying plants and animals, settled through the floodwaters, fossil wrapping and burying Eventually, the crack became so wide that the newly exposed Eventually floor of the, the subterranean chamber so sprung upward, giving the birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth upward, like the seam of a baseball. The, the continental plates, with lubricating water like still beneath them, baseball. slid downhill the plates, away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. Downhill. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of approximately 40 to 50 miles per hour, they ran into resistance, and like a runaway crashing train, they compressed, crushed, and like buckled, a runaway crashing train, and thickened, they rising out of the floodwaters. Buckled. This is why the major mountains are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges from which this is they why slid. The major mountains are generally Today's parallel to the major ridges from which they were slid. all pushed up. In Today's hours. major mountains. The hydroplates, in sliding away from the Mid Atlantic Ridge, opened up very deep ocean bases sliding away from the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Opened up very deep ocean bases. This theory of a massive worldwide catastrophe in antiquity appears to support the biblical story of the deluge in every detail. Appears to support the biblical story of the deluge in every detail. from the Bible that the earth was founded upon the seas. That's the way the psalmist explained to us. In the creation story that God gathered the waters together to let dry land appear. Now the only way you can gather waters together and dry land appear is to get the, some of that water off the surface. Otherwise you would just gather it together, let it go, and it would go back down. Again, the water that created the flood is still with us. If we were to flatten out the surface of this planet, roughly 9,000 foot of water is what we'd have across the surface. Equally, in the story of the deluge, the Bible tells us the fountains of the great deep were broken up. That was the source of most of that water. Now the big thing I want you to consider with me just real quick is that pressure of 372,000 pounds per square inch. Or even if you make that crust just a mile thick, or yeah, um, excuse me, 10 miles thick, um, you're still looking at 60,000 PSI. Now if you're like me, maybe that's a number that's hard to get your head around. I mean, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about a 60 mile granite crust about a mile, give or take, of water here, and then the, the o o shallower oceans than we have today, much shallower on the surface. We're talking immense pressure. So to help you get your head around this, I want to show a video that we'll talk about in just a second. This is roughly 350 PSI that does this destruction. A modern example of rapid erosion of bedrock from cavitation comes from Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado River just above the Grand Canyon. Excessive snowfall from the high country of the upper Colorado River Basin in late spring of 1983 caused excessive runoff that poured into Lake Powell at rates of up to 148,000 cubic feet per second. This rapid inflow threatened to overflow Glen Canyon Dam. To control the high flow rates, the power plant was run at full capacity, releasing 28,000 cubic feet per second through the turbines. Then the outlet tubes were opened to drain another 17,000 cubic feet per second. This was still not enough. 
the emergency situation required engineers to risk damage to the spillway tunnel. And on June 15, the 40-foot diameter left spillway tunnel was opened to drain an additional 13,000 cubic feet per second, which was then raised to 17,000 cubic feet per second. Then on June 28, the flow was increased to 32,000 cubic feet per second. At this point, the water exiting the tunnel became red, and noticeable ground vibrations earthquakes were felt by engineers. Large blocks of concrete and bedrock came hurling from the 40-foot diameter tunnel. After closing the spillway tunnel, the survey team discovered extensive cavitation damage. The three-foot-thick steel-reinforced concrete lining of the tunnel was penetrated by huge pits. At an elbow where the tunnel leveled out, a hole 32 feet deep, 150 feet long, and 40 feet wide was cut through the lining into red sandstone bedrock. This hole required 63,000 cubic feet of concrete to fill. The repair process to the enormous hole shows the vast extent of the damage. The speed of erosion in the Glen Canyon Dam spillway tunnel occurred very rapidly during the period when the red color of water appeared and ground vibrations were generated. It is possible that cavitation was pulverizing concrete, steel, and sandstone at the rate of 1,000 cubic feet per second during the peak period of erosion. The destructive effects of cavitation at Glen Canyon Dam tell us the Grand Canyon could have been eroded very quickly by the sudden release of a huge volume of water above the canyon. By the sudden release of a huge it's the answer to the Grand Canyon, but canyon. picture with me for a second. Glen Canyon Dam is 710 feet tall. That means the water column at its tallest would have been 710. At 711, it would have went over the dam. That's less than 350 PSI at the bottom of the water column. That 350 PSI did all that damage that you see in the spillway tunnel when that spillway tunnel was opened up to allow the water to flow. Imagine the damage of thousands of PSI would have done to bedrock as it's hurling it into our atmosphere and beyond our atmosphere and cavitation is shredding and pulverizing the rock as it happens. Whatever you're envisioning of the cataclysm, it's probably worse than that. But again, I wanted you to have an idea of what we're talking about. This is what created the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around our planet, 46,000 miles. It is the longest mountain chain on our planet totally submerged over 60 feet tall. This is the mountain chain that caused the hydroplates when it popped up due to the change in weight, that, that resistance going away, the crust lifts up and those crustal plates move and slide. This is where you can see an easy fit of the continents. And as they slide away, it opens up the Atlantic Ocean. Pangea, the, some of the immediate questions are, hey, where's Mexico, where's Panama, where's Costa Rica, where's Gu Guatemala, where's Honduras? Why was Africa swung, th shrunk 35% to make this work? What forces could rotate North America clockwise and South America counterclockwise? You see, Pangea does not work, but Walt Brown's theory works perfectly when you understand the cataclysm and what caused those plates not to move inches a year, to move miles in days, months. There's the mid-oceanic mid ridge, that's obviously the Atlantic side that wraps around our planet, fractures in both directions as it was lifted up and fractured. So now let's talk about conditions that lead to the global flood. Pastor alluded to these last week. So let's look at what the Bible says about the conditions that lead to God stepping in and opening up the fountains of the great deep. Genesis 6, 5 through 8 says this, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creepy thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now you can catch the anthropomorphic language, the language of man, right? That God is sorry, that God regrets. Um, again, God knew everything that was going to happen when he created man. But he's explaining to us how this grieved him. Man's sin, as it always does, grieved him. And here God steps in. 
So he sees the wickedness of man on the earth. And look at how it's described. Every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. It wasn't just his actions. Every thought, his thoughts were bent toward evilness. This is what grieved God. This is what caused God to move. And he said, I will destroy man. Both man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air. Again, if you're trying to get a local flood to work, you're going to have problem with language like that. That implies a universal flood where everything that's not on the ark, that picture of Jesus Christ we talked about, is destroyed. But I love the next verse. But Noah, because of his outward obedience to the law. No. Noah, like you and I, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah heard the Lord. Noah obeyed the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, just like you and I. No different. So that's really the conditions that lead to the global cataclysm, the flood. Let's look at the command to build the ark. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Again, you're going to have a problem with a local flood on that statement. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. So just a few things here we'll highlight. Number one, the end of all flesh. Again, you're going to have a problem with a local flood. I will destroy them. Make the ark out of gopher wood. Now, theologians disagree exactly what gopher wood is. So what we do know is Noah knew what gopher wood was. Noah went and got gopher wood. And Noah built the ark. And Noah probably had much more help than his three sons, but we'll talk about that later. And then the Bible tells us, it tells Noah that he's to make rooms in the ark. Now you can rest assured that God had much more to say than the few things we're going to see tonight to Noah. But God's not recording for us in the Bible a manual to build our own ark. Rather, he's giving the highlights of a story to us, the details of that ark construction he would have no doubt given to Noah. But he does tell us some facts he told Noah both to pitch it, make it watertight, both inside and out, going on. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the width 50 cubits, the height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So just a few things here. The length, the 300, the 50, the 30, that's a standard good measurement for building ships. It still works today. That'll work when you build any ship. He was told to make a window in the ark and finish it from a cubit from above. So what theologians believe is this window across the top ran a great portion of the length of the ark. We don't know how much, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it was a cubit high or a cubit from the top. And that window probably ran, if you look at this model down here, it has it running the entire length of the ark. We don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us. Again, God's not trying to get us to build an ark. He's trying to get us to understand the significance of the story and how this ark preserved life. So he tells him how to finish the window, and then he tells him to set one door. This massive ark only has one door. What a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way. Yeah, the door's in the front. <laughs> one door into the ark. There's one way to make it into the ark, one way to be saved. That story still holds true today. And then it had three decks, and that is the end of what the Bible tells us about the ark. Anything beyond that we can speculate, but that's really the end of the details of the ark. Now, with that in mind, um, before we get into the dimensions of the ark, I was going to let Garrett, Derek come, talk about the ark he's made, as well as some measurements and other things that he's been involved with in reference to the ark. And are we hot there? There is a door here. So there's a door. Ta-da. <laughs> uh. Turn to your Bible to Genesis chapter 6 real quick, please. <clears throat> uh, Rich stole a little of my thunder, but that's okay. Um, just to give you an idea, I, I still can't wrap my mind around this. 370 PSI. Just to let you know, water pressure is nothing to be playing around with, okay? It's so serious that we don't have any any of that equipment on our work. We have old saws, okay? But just to give you an idea, about 8,000 PSI will cut your arm off. Just 8,000. Okay, anyway, all right. 
turn to your Bible, Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> yeah, but anyway, okay, real quick. Let's get back to the cubits, okay? Did you, did you get the cubit measurement on the, no, not yet, not yet. But anyway, there are different types of cubics, okay? Yeah, go ahead and put that up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we don't know which cubit that he used, but anyway, a basic cubit is from the bottom of your elbow to the top of your forefinger. Yes. Sorry. Um, but anyway, all right. With that in mind, we I used uh, 18, the minimum, and that would make the arc's length 450 feet long. So you figure a, a football field is 300 yards or uh, 100 yards, 300 feet. So this was another football field and a half. Okay, so we're looking at almost a football field and a half. And then the width was uh, 75 feet, and then the height was 45 feet. Anyway, okay. So with that dimension, that's just the minimum, okay? And there's uh, people out there that want to say that that wouldn't have floated, it wouldn't have worked, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it worked. And I'll tell you why. This was not a sailing ship. It was a, like a barge, okay? So the water lifted it up, moved it down wherever it wanted, God wanted it to go, and set it back down. With the runes that they had to put in there, that would have sturdied the ark up tremendously. And then, of course, the pitch on the outside and on the inside would have just, you know, you got an ark. There you go. So, anyway, um, Brother Gary, can you hook me up there? And uh, I'm going to let this guy here tell you about more than I could ever tell you about. And let me get his name up real quick. Uh, his name is Branyon May, and he has got a doctorate's degree in astrophysics. Right. And the breaking, and the breaking loose of the fountains, of the fountains of the deep. The floodwaters, the floodwaters covered, covered all the mountains, all the across, mountains the across the entire earth. And God's and plan, God's and plan and preparation, and preparation for the survival, for the survival of, life of life was fully was realized. Fully realized. When reading through the, when reading through account, the Bible's account, not only are the, not general, only are the general descriptions of land animals, of land animals given, given, birds, birds cattle, geese, cattle, and creeping, beasts, things, and creeping things, but three but times, three the, times Bible the Bible tells us that the us animals that were either, either saved or destroyed had the breath of life. Breath of life. Thus, when we Thus, survey, when we survey the, modern the modern descriptions of the kingdoms of life, the Bible's account, the Bible's only, account describes only describes life in the kingdom, in the kingdom of Animalia. Of Animalia. So Noah did not so have, Noah to, take did not have to take representatives from the kingdom of the, the, kingdom of the plant or the fungi or the protus or the different types of bacteria. And despite fungi, many pages of skeptical critique, Noah did not take any aquatic animals. And no despite algae, many pages clams, of skeptical critique, no fish. Noah did not sharks, take any aquatic animals, even air breathing no mammals, no algae, barnacles, clams, whales. no fish. According to the catalog of life. Or which is even air breathing mammals such taxonomy. as dolphins or whales. There are just over according one to the catalog of life, known species which is an international in database of taxonomy. However, there are just the over one million in animalia, known species. The majority are either in the kingdom aquatic, of animalia, such as the however of the numerous phyla in animalia, the majority are either aquatic or such as the phyla of cnidaria, auriferae, echinodermata, and bryozoa, such as mollusca, or Monolita, they are composed of creatures that do not fit and in the fact, Bible's description. Over 85 such as mollusca, of Monolita, all animal species are found in the and in fact, phylum over 85% which includes all over 700,000 cattle are found in the single phylum of, of the arthropods and although we may which includes over 700,000 cattle species of insects they were not required past and although we may of think of insects and because bugs they neither as being fit the definition of the Hebrew word they were not required passengers on the ark or they do because not because they neither fit the definition of the Hebrew word in their translated creeping thing 
The phylum that or contains they do the not main fit the description of, of having the breath that of do life fit the required biblical specifications. The is phylum that, the that contains the main class of animals that do fit the required biblical specifications species. is that of the chordates. Are in the aquatic Yet even in this single fish, phylum of approximately 61,000 species, roughly half in are in the aquatic class of bony fish. The Bible's description. Which leaves approximately 31,000 species are the mammals in four major classes fitting the Bible's description. These four major classes are the mammals with over 4,800 species. species, the birds with the over 9,900 species, 9, species, the amphibians with over 6,400 species, species, well species, and the reptiles with almost 9,800 species. These four classes represent the most well-known well and studied that we have not air breathing land and the dinosaurs. This group of extinct there is animals one more well known group of organisms because that we have not discussed that the dinosaurs. Interpretation this group of extinct animals can sometimes be missed because of the confusion that evolutionary interpretation applies. Although we do As not part know of God's creation, the dinosaurs, dinosaurs were absolutely real members of the animal we do kingdom. Know that whichever Although we do not know how or Noah, when each dinosaur kind went the extinct, if they had we do know that whichever kinds were alive at the time of Noah would have been passengers However, on the ark let's address two if they had major fit on the Bible's required First, we are usually enamored with the largest of However, dinosaurs. However, let's address Power two major misconceptions. First, we are usually enamored with the largest of dinosaurs, towering over us at museums. Yet these the Brachiosaurus, large Argentinosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, Stegosaurus. The majority were actually Yet these large small, specimens represent and only the a small of fraction of dinosaurs. Somewhere between the vast majority were actually quite small, and further, and the average, average size of all dinosaurs was somewhere between dinosaur. a sheep. We are and a not cow. told in scripture that the animals had and to be. And further, adults. this average so size is for an had adult dinosaur. We are not told in scripture that the animals the had to be adults, so God could have easily had the younger animals about and dinosaurs that there arrive at the ark for Noah to load. Just as we have discussed, the, the second misconception about dinosaurs species. is that there were the millions of, of different species. Dinosaur species. Just as we have discussed, the reasonable numbers of animals. So we can species. easily add to the our number of named dinosaur species dinosaur is less than 1,000. So, so far, we can we easily add to our figures 1,000 following the species statistics of taxonomy. The so far, we have discussed the potential numbers of animals by following the species statistics of taxonomy. But the most the modern definition of the term species can be a very controversial a discussion among scientists. That actually but the most popular definition states that a nature. species is in this sense, a, species a group of individuals that actually or potentially conditions. interbreed in this nature. Concept, though, in this sense, a species is the biggest gene pool possible under natural conditions. This concept, though, in its current form, has only been around for a few hundred years since the time of Carl Linnaeus. It represents modern humanity's approach to categorizing and studying life on there Earth. Are many known Although the species is supposed to represent the, the largest pool of interbreeding has been organisms, used to define there are many known exceptions to this definition. Species. The term hybrid has been used to define an offspring from parents of separate species. Occur and actually, there are three that are within different the same degrees genus. of hybridization. Examples Interspecific of hybrids the occur between different species, species that are within the same genus. Examples of this include Wolves, the canine genus, jackals, where distinct species of domesticated dogs, there have similarly coyotes, been hybrids in the wolves, genus of bears, and jackals, have been known to interbreed. Bear hybrids. There have Seen similarly the been hybrids in the genus of bears, including grizzly polar bear hybrids, hybrids seen abound, both in the wild species of and felines, captivity. Species of geese, Additional examples of interspecific hybrids goals, abound. Finches, between species Chickens, of felines, crocodiles, species of geese, many, many species of woodpeckers, the gulls, of finches, that we see are chickens, crocodiles, and many, which many occur more. Between different the second degree of hybrids that we see are genera. intergeneric hybrids, examples of this type which occur of between different species of the bovine that are also family. from different genera. Specifically, the examples of this type of hybrid include members of the bovine and family, cattle. specifically with the, the interbreeding genus, between the bovine genus, genus American which includes yaks and domesticated cattle. Cattle, bison, with the bison genus, which includes the American and the European bison. In the United States. Cattle bison and hybrids have been observed naturally the since the mid-1700s in the United States. And intentional crosses, Another example such as of the, the intergeneric beefalo, hybrid, have existed since the mid-1800s. Another example of the intergeneric hybrid includes various members of the duck family, the bald pate, specifically the, the interbreeding the between duck. single species Other containing the mallard, include members of the bald pates, the Warblers, redhead and the wood duck and felines. Other like examples of this type include surfer. members of hummingbirds, warblers, rare, swallows, the final and felines like the caracal and serval. 
which occur between Although different rare, species the final degree that are of hybrids are the interfamilial hybrids, in different which occur between families. different species Examples that are not only in different genera, but also in different and taxonomic families. families. Between Examples of this form of hybrid exist between, between the families of ducks and, and geese families. and between the families between of pheasant and, and grouse and families. Between the families of ducks and geese and between the families all of, of these sparrows hybrids. And is that finishes. even though scientists may have cataloged animals the important into aspect to recognize species, concerning all of these hybrids ways is, valuable. is that even though scientists the may have cataloged animals into only a distinct species that which in many ways is valuable the classification still represents only a theoretical boundary this means that man has discussion of the animals on the especially when it applies to potential interbreeding species we've mentioned what this means for really our discussion of the animals on the ark since numerous species is that the numbers of defined species we've mentioned pair, are really upper limits pair from since numerous species may have been represented this by a single common the pair Bible's use of the rather than a pair from every species kind. Is not this distinction acknowledges species. that the Bible's use of the phrase probably after their kind is not restricted like to our modern term family. species. And in many cases, For our probably is equivalent though, we will to a higher tax species count like genus as an or overestimate of the total number of animals. For our discussion, though, we will in simply to use the, the species count as an overestimate of the total number of animals on the ark. In addition to the common two of each kind. God further, further elaborated that each of the clean animals, animals Noah would take seven of each kind of the flood on account. Though the further identification of clean versus unclean the is not given in the context of the flood account. Using the law of Moses account, has lengthy of discussions of the qualifications of clean animal kinds. So we can easily account for the Using these as a guide, the numbers of clean animal kinds up. was quite restricted. So all in all, so we can easily account for the additional clean animals by simply rounding our numbers up. So all in all, birds, here are the total numbers of individual animals. 12,000 mammals, 20,000 birds, 20,000 reptiles, Before loading these and 13,000 individual amphibians. creatures on the ark. We need to address a couple of Before loading these 65,000 individual First, creatures on the ark, for the we need to address a couple of final but key issues. We need to utilize First, a to conveniently account for the diversity in animal representative and sizes. Size for each we need class. to utilize a reasonable this can be done fairly average easily using or common representative animal size for each class. Sizes. This can be done fairly easily mammals, using the results from some about the scientific surveys of animal like sizes. Elephants, hippos or horses. If we look at the but mammals, the biological we might think about the large the creatures, mass like elephants, is hippos or horses. Pounds, but the biological small, surveys have found that the most common mass of an adult mammal is less mammal than 10 pounds, or in the rodent which might sound small, except when we consider that, that approximately 40% of all mammal species are in the rodent order. Or even having to take An important point to mention here is that there was no requirement for taking the oldest or largest, or even having to take adults. With Adolescents or juveniles would have been suitable in most cases. Frogs and toads Similarly for amphibians, the most common with approximately 85% of all species being in the frogs and toads Likewise, order, there are only a the most common adult mass of approximately like a quarter of a pound is reasonable. So the most Likewise, there are only a few larger reptiles, like the Komodo dragon or crocodile. The birds, so the most common mass is also approximately a quarter of a pound. And, and finally, for the for birds, their most common mass is mammal less than one tenth of a pound. To be the size of a juvenile what this means sheep. is that for convenience, well we'll approximate all of the mammal individuals on board the ark and to be the size of a juvenile sheep, well overestimating we the less than ten pound size. And for all sheep. the numbers of birds, Again, amphibians, and reptiles, we can approximate the them to be the size to of a medium-sized sheep. What were the animal accommodations Again, necessary? Again, an overestimate. How tightly arranged the second were the key animals. question to consider is: the Bible tells what us were the animal Noah accommodations necessary for the animals? How and tightly arranged were the animals? But the Bible tells us that Noah was to make rooms for the animals corrals, and to prepare stores of food. Are not given. But exact so dimensions for the various the compartments, necessary pens, for the corrals, or cages there are, two are not modern given. Day analogies so engaging the space requirements necessary for the animals on the ark, there are two modern day analogies that we will utilize. Modern animal transportation that neither and modern layerage or really housing fit standards. The ark situation. The it ark is important to first notice that neither of these two B, comparisons like really fit the ark situation. Market. The ark was not neither a short-term trip from long point A to point B, like, like transporting cattle from facility. pasture to market. The ark neither was, was the ark a long-term environment, which carried like a zoo or research facility. The ark was a survival barge, thus which carried precious cargo above the flood's waters. For a limited time duration. A nice lower Thus, looking at modern standards for both for transportation and housing, 
simply provides how a much nice space lower would the animals have occupied? an upper limit for the space As we have seen, the ark is an immense vessel. So how much space total would the animals 100, have occupied? Square feet of deck space. As we have seen, the ark is an immense vessel with a total of over 100,000 square feet of deck space. In terms relating to transportation, the ark size was equivalent to the volume of 527 railroad well, boxcars. Railroad boxcars. From as far when we consider the, the transportation of animals, the, industry, the recommended density for travel have been fairly consistent. From as far back as the 1920s in the railroad industry through the trucking the industry of 240 today, using published recommended capacities, a common dual deck boxcar could transport 240 mid-sized sheep. Mid all fit within if we assume 12,000 individual mammals represented by sheep, a poultry then they would all fit within 50 boxcars. Of stacked cages. For our smaller animal kinds, a poultry boxcar that contains numerous if levels we assume of stacked cages total could carry approximately 3,000 medium-sized chickens. Amphibians and reptiles. If we assume a combined they total of 53,000 individual bucks. birds, amphibians, Thus, and reptiles, using the relative then they would all occupy less than and the modern transportation cars. standards. The Thus, using the relative sizes and numbers of known species and the modern transportation the standards, the ARC's animals would only occupy approximately 13% of the total or volume, or 68 boxcars, boxcars for food, water, leaving an incredible 87% or 459 boxcars for food, short water, and additional living railways space. Or now, we acknowledge that these percentages are based on relatively short-term arrangements that found in railways or trucking, large oceans but they also match many seafaring livestock carriers that Europe. transfer cattle across However, large oceans from Australia to the Middle East or from South America to Temple Europe. Grandin, and other However, for long-term standards for the recommendations that we can utilize the work of Professor Temple Grandin and other animal science experts for the recommendations of animal storage and research facilities. Of space. Using Thus, the recommended the floor space allotments, would a mid-sized sheep should have around 5 square feet, feet of space. The remaining Thus, the 12,000 mammals would require approximately 60,000 square feet. The, size of a chicken the remaining 53,000 birds, amphibians, and reptiles that we are approximating as the, the size of a chicken these numbers would occupy 26,000 square feet of the at the recommended half a square foot allotment. For the these numbers result in approximately 85% of the ark's deck space to being feet. utilized for the animals. Cages for the birds, With each deck reptiles, having roughly a height of 12 to 15 feet, would have been easily stacked cages for the birds. Amphibians the overall and reptiles space needed, and many small and mammals caring for the would have been easily managed if and would greatly reduce the overall deck space needed and, reptiles, and make caring for the animals even more efficient. If the pins the and cages for at least the birds, amphibians, and reptiles feet, were stacked only too high, the deck space the required would drop by 13,000 square feet, animals would which is quite a substantial amount. And Thus, using the modern animal space, housing standards, which is the ARC's animals would occupy between 70 and 85% and would leave 15 of the total to 30% deck space, for food, which is 15 water, to 18 basketball courts, or between three to and would leave 15 to 30% for food, of course, water, even and living facilities, or between three to six basketball courts. That would be 15% of the Of course, volume, even at the minimum of 15% for storage and living, that would mean 15% of the ark's water volume, tanks, etc. since the food stores so could easily be stacked into grain be bins, barrels, cupboards, water tanks, etc. Which so 15% of the total volume would be equivalent to a quarter and a half million cubic feet, swimming pools. which is over 79 boxcars box cars, or two and a half so Olympic-sized swimming pools. Considering an I know that we have discussed lots of numbers, sizes, and volumes. We so let's summarize it. All of the animals Considering an overestimate of 65,000 animals reality on the ark, we can easily fit all of the animals on board the with room to spare. Transportation comparison. The reality of the ark's animal accommodations would be somewhere between the short-term transportation at comparison at the 15%, the difference between these and the long-term housing comparison a more accurate at the 85%. For the space required if we split the difference be between these two scenarios, the then a more accurate so percentage for the animal be space required of the arc would be 50% of the total arc. Cages and pins. So a good estimate would While be the that other half of the half of the arc would be taken up by animal family, corrals, and storage, cages and pins. Food, While the other half of the ark would be living areas for Noah and his family, goal has been to focus and storage on the for account, food, water, in order to understand and other the reality of Noah's ark. Now our goal has been to, to focus on the Bible's account, in, in order to understand the reality we have of Noah's ark, many of the and to dispel of all of the, the exaggerations and misconceptions. Since they have ignored, as we have seen, many of the criticisms of Noah and the ark have no. Foundation, since the they have ignored what the Bible is actually outlined, that would be on the ark. 
God's instructions for Noah clearly outlined the specific kinds of animals who claim that would be on the ark, or hundreds and that God would bring them to Noah. Despite skeptics who claim that millions or hundreds of millions of animals were required on the ark. Both the, the biblical records and the scientific the data firmly reject suited such a notion. The, precious cargo the ark the was an immense vessel Throughout the with a capacity camp, perfectly suited for, for the precious cargo it would carry. While there were many Throughout the entire account, was it is important for us to recognize God's role. While there were many Genesis physical duties seven, that Noah was tasked with accomplishing. Uh, 16. <clears throat> and they that went in, went in male, and female, all of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut them in. The Lord shut the door. I want to make that very clear. All right, that's all I have, brother. You ready? <laughs> um, so again, the estimate of 65,000 would have been based on species. That is a modern taxonomy. Um, the creationists, even the most liberal numbers, are about half that. Mm -hmm. So again, regardless of how you slice this, even you, with you, if you use species or if you use animal kinds in what we're estimating, you're dealing with an ark that is principally 40 to 60 percent unoccupied. That makes Noah's offer to board the ark to escape the coming destruction a legitimate offer that many men and women could have participated in, and yet they chose not to. Um, now, most theologians, to kind of wrap up my point, believe that the ark was following the royal Egyptian cubit model, which is 20.65 inches. Now, maybe you're wondering, why do they think that? That's a good question. The oldest standard of measurement we know of happens to be the ancient Egyptian cubit. A number of cubit rods have survived. Two are known from the tomb of Maya, the treasure of King Tut, and another was found in the tomb of Ka in Thebes. This is the old Egyptian ancient cubit that measures 20.6 inches. This is the one that was found in the tomb, one of the ones that was found in Maya's tomb. If that was the measurement, then the ark was 515 feet. So you have to have, you're going to have an ark at the small end, 450, at the large end, 515. That's from Answers in Genesis uh, magazine. They believe it was the Egyptian long cubit. That's a comparison of the 515-foot arc, 86-foot wide, 52-foot tall, compared to the Titanic. There it is compared to the Santa Maria, the Wyoming, the Titanic, and the Queen Mary. There it is, buses. It would be, I would guess what, 10 buses long, and let's see, I can't quite read it. Um, four buses high. Uh, again, a massive arc at 515 feet. There's me standing next to a model at Ron Wyatt's museum. There's answers in Genesis model. There's a to-scale model at the Ark Experience. You can see how small those F-150s are sitting below it. Here's the key point. 450 to 515 feet with plenty of room to carry all the animals, all the food. And so, Pastor, you come on up and we'll pick that topic up here, Lord willing, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Derek.